Um, I think it's fine, I said, I'm sure it's okay. It's okay. Um, first time for to come out, I called Esther yesterday, it's the last week of the summer. I'm like, you know, who's going to show up the last week of the summer? I'm very happy that people are here. And uh, either people, you know, the title maybe was good, or just, uh, you know, it's, uh, what else can we do the last week of the summer? How much work can we get to be going on? Um, I'm talk about a couple things. So I want to talk about today, El, the month of El, which just talks a lot about growing and it's a time of opportunity and a time to get close to, to yourself and to other people. And I don't try to phrase it that way because you don't want to get, you know, get close to God. It's a funny thing, get close to God. But because we all define that you know, in our own way, you know, God shines on those people who are close to people closest to them. That's what God shines on. And for most people, the, the, the relationships there's, there's issues in, in, in personal relationships. I'm going to talk about those a bit too. Um, so I'm going to talk about in the second part of the class, kind of, you know, falling, loving others and then loving yourself. Loving others and loving yourself. It's going to be a topic. But I wanted to, to start first. Um, I, just about, I was in Israel this past week, you know, five days, and a very you know, good time. I went north. I lived in Israel six years, many, many moons ago. And when you learn Israel, everybody, everybody speaks English, right? You know, everybody speaks English. In Jerusalem, it's Jerusalem six years. So, so you, you know, and I go out with my Yankees cap and have, like, you know, like a, I work in Maryland, I have like, like a financial, like, company shirt on or something like that. You know, so, you know, something like, you know, I reek American, you know what I mean? And uh, when I go to shul in the mornings, so I have my, maybe black and white on then, like my Yamak on. But in Jerusalem, if you say, like, if you say Boca Raton, the buddy's like, guys like, hey, I'm from Borough Park, buddy. I'd say good morning to me. I'm saying, like, everybody's American now, or they're from South Africa, or from somewhere else. Um, but, you know, it's really long. There was, you know, 60, 60 kids have lost their lives in the past two months in this war. You know, it's like, and it, and it's, it's so you go there, and, like, everybody knows somebody who, who passed away and died. And you, see, and you see the pictures on the, like, in the or the Yeshiva world. I never saw one shot. I said, father. You know, broken, crying over his son, and there was a woman who, um, you know, her husband was killed, and she gave birth two weeks later. You know, it's a very, very emotional time, and and there's no reason for the war other than they want to kill us. There's no reason to have this. We tell them in Gaza, you know, do whatever you want. Build, build universities, build factories, make money, do good deeds. Do just don't shoot us. You, know, you want you, you want you want you want to land in boats with all kinds of uh, the building materials. Great. Just don't build tunnels to kill us. It, it's a very simple trade. I would take that trade and say, you know, I would you know, start a country in Israel, have the rest of the world give me billions of dollars of money, not have to pay for anything, and build great things that are doing good deeds in the world. Not worry about anything. It's a great place to live. It's beautiful. But instead, they want they want to kill us, and we have to fight that every single every month, every year, whatever it is. And there's you know. And we have to recognize why, so why is that? Why is that? I don't know. Right? But I think it's very important just to think about that. And to, in this, this, there was a student today, a 23 year yeshiva kid, who they found dead in the forest in Jerusalem. Well, they thought first he was kidnapped by the Palestinians, maybe, and it was much worse. And instead, it looks like maybe he slipped and fell down a cliff. He had no phone with him. And, 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 and he's passed away. It looks that way. And it's still, it's, it's terrible for his parents, 23 year old American kid. It was gone. It ruins a person's world. So I want to tell you a story to start off about the uh, the Yom Kippur War, and then we'll start talking about what it means to uh, just as just real true love. It was a family who moved to Israel, Moshe Cohen, in the early 70s. That was when Israel was really. You go there now; they're playing the Rolling Stones. All the cab drivers lived in Los Angeles for a long time. They knew New Jersey. I live in New Jersey. If you go to the Garden State Plaza. Every booth is an Israeli booth, right? You can speak Hebrew. You know, it's, it's, it's. But in the 1960s and 70s, it was, it was. They played Israeli folk music on the buses. It was, it was, it was very, very inspirational. The name of their Megaliah, him and his wife from New Jersey, New York, and he, and he joined the army. And he was called up to fight in the Yom Kippur War. And, uh, you know, like everyone else, all of a sudden, just happened in the Yom Kippur War. He's called up to fight, and he was a musician motion. He used to sing songs. And the key part about Israel is that the, the, the front there, it's not like Napoleon attacking Russia, right, or Hitler attacking Russia, where you got to run your supply lines over 200 miles of frozen tundra. There ain't much supply lines in Israel. You can go to war, you go to Gaza, it's 45 minutes away. You drive back home. Like this past war in Israel, they had a staging area. That's how they got the Gaza Strip, 
where all the soldiers were, and you had, you had 40 barbers come in one day and give everybody haircuts. Right? My friends were bringing food to them. And they were, they were, you know, they were it was a 40 minute drive to the front. That's what it is. And, and you, you're crossing Gaza, you're in no man's land. But before that, you're right here, it's, it's an unusual place. So this man, this guy Moshe, would go, would go into battle in Yom Kippur, and he would sing songs, and he would record songs for his daughter, her name was Gila. Gila Rina, I mean song, joy. He was a little honey, Gila means joy, I think. Gila, Gila Rina means joy. So that was named joy. And so he would sing songs to her. And he would say to his friends, ah, at her wedding, I'm going to sing a beautiful song for her. So he wrote these songs for his daughter Gila in the, during the, the war. And unfortunately, as the war got worse, it was a very deadly war, the Yom Kippur War, Moshe was killed. He was killed in the war, and we left a wife and a daughter, maybe she was two years old at the time, and they went back to America. Because what do you do in Israel? Is that your husband there? And that's went back to a family in America. And, uh, and in, like in the whole tumult of the war, they left you know, his stuff there, she went back quickly. They couldn't, you know, they, they were buried him properly, they left very quickly. She was very, very sad. And after a couple years, she got remarried in America. And she changed her last name. The daughter kept her father's last name, Gila Cohen. And many years later, Gila meets like a half Israeli, half American boy. And she went on one of those, you know, like I say, college program. She was, you know, she was like, I was Orthodox, like a Jewish girl, obviously, on a program. And she met a, uh, a boy. And the boy's family is going to come in to Toronto for her wedding. Fine, this must have been, I'm like 1990 something, around that time. And so the boy comes in, first time in America, she was over there. I think she met the mother, maybe not the stepfather. Uh, and come, and all, all the family comes in, it's an excuse to come to America. They all come into America. And his uncle sees Gila for the first time and like recognizes her face. She blew eyes the way her face was. And says, they're coming, your name's Cullen? Are you related to a guy named Moshe Cullen who died in the Yom Kippur War? She's like, you know, my father. So the guy says, you can't, start shaking, you can't believe it. You're the daughter, he says. He says, I was, I was in the same like, barracks as your father. I was the advantage of your father. And he made tapes for you for your wedding. He said, I saved those tapes and all his stuff for 20 years. Like, you know, like that, metal, that metal container, he's in the army, like a metal container, the, the old stuff. He said, I couldn't, I couldn't throw it away. And I figured one day his family would come for it. And no one knew who you were or where the mother was. How are you going to find him? He says he has to get it. So he calls home to Israel. And they send over the tapes that the father made 20 years earlier. Send them to America. And they may rework the one it was. And when she walked down the aisle, <clears throat> 20 years later, her father sang to her the song to compose in the Empire of War 20 years earlier. Right? That's what happens. So they're now with kids, whatever it is, but that's it. That's what it means, I say, that's a father's love for a child. That's what it means to love someone. That's how God works himself throughout the world, right? He makes beautiful things like this happen. It's like that really happened in the world. That's it. So I'm gonna start with that story. It's a beautiful story. And your kipper is coming up. And so many times you feel at this time of year that you know it's uh, the Judaism is, is, an, is an old man's, you know, someone's saying no or it's negative, you've got to feel guilty. I want to talk the other side, that it's, that, that, that it's a beautiful religion, and that, and that God loves us, and God cares about us, and wants what's best for us, and wants always to make us grow, and is always forgiving of us. That's what I'm talking about. The, um, so, if we go back three weeks earlier, it was just Tisha But I always think that God orchestrates the Jewish year in such a, a growth-oriented way. Right, it makes you, I think two things, one thing, one thing I think bad is, is that the summertime is so much fun, and God drops like L right in the middle. So you got to start thinking about like being a good boy. Russia is coming only a month away. You got to repent. You got to shoot. You can't like no. You can't. You can't enjoy yourself in the summer. I would tell my friends if summer was in South Africa, you would summer in January. I'd have much more fun because I could do more stuff. But here you got to got to watch yourself. But in with Tisha B'av, the temples were destroyed two times. Now why were they destroyed? The first temple was destroyed because of the big three. Right? We worshipped idols and we did murder, we murdered people, and we did illicit relations, things we shouldn't do uh, in immorality. Those are the big three. And if you're asking me, those big three things, if I was a God, I would also be upset about that, right? Because the immorality is controlling your own, your own desires. And, and killing other people is jealousy, right? And, and worshiping other gods is, well, he's our God, right? Worshiping other gods, I'm the person you should be loyal to. 
Those are the big three. That makes sense to me. It says in the, in the second temple that it wasn't that way. That the second temple was destroyed because of, you know, it says Sinus Fina, but, but a, a gratuitous hatred, not, not liking somebody, being against somebody else. That's what happened during the, the second temple. So I'm going to put it from the Nitziv. It says this, that the, um, he says that the second, the second base, if you look at the, the holy books, right, the Svam Kedoshim, the holy books, it says this. It says in the second temple destruction, it was a very holy generation, but they were very stubborn. They learned Torah. So it was like it was today. Right today, I think that the Jewish world is, is thriving, thriving. There's people who are very, very wealthy. Lakewood has a gazillion people. There's 45 kosher restaurants in Manhattan alone, right? If you walk to a restaurant and it's not like OU, you get upset. I, was, I work in Merrill Lynch, New Jersey, and every couple times a year, they, we're working at like a type A building somewhere, so they give us like a, like a, like a treat or just a walk. So this past week, they gave us ice cream. Walk down downstairs at 12 o'clock, you get a little ice cream, you know, with all the jimmies and all that stuff like that. So I come down, and I like ice cream too. So I say, you know, is it kosher? Pops the bag. It's Huff K, of course it's kosher. The ice cream's kosher, and the jimmies are kosher, and the chocolate's kosher. It's much better for my, my figure if it wasn't kosher, but it's kosher, right? it's kosher. Everything these days is kosher. It, and that's what it was back then. It was, it was a wonderful time. What was the problem? It says people didn't, people with disdain upon one another, right? They said, you know what, a person's a little less religious than you, they dress differently, they're Hasidic, they wear a blue shirt, they wear a blue yarmulke, you look down upon them, who are you, right? You think, you know, me, I'm the one, I always think, you know, when, when I live in Pasek, right? So there's a different shul there in Pasek. So one shul, their custom on Shabbos morning is the guys get up at 8 o'clock in the morning, they pray till 10, then they study Torah for an hour, and okay, they go home. Another guy says to me, how can they do that? It's bad for the families. You have to, you know, you, you have to be stay home later, let your wife get up first, go to school at 9 o'clock, you finish at 11 o'clock, and then it's better for you. I think there's no one do something your own way, but some other people there, you know, they're bad. So, you know, I, when I go around, I teach a lot sometimes, you go to, you go to a synagogue, right, out of town somewhere, a shul, I guess, somewhere, and the guy will say, look, this shul you lost. I was in Philadelphia. You know, why? We're right smack in the middle. Right, right in the middle? This guy here, he is, this is right smack in the middle. We appreciate everybody, and we're all signs, and this is the way we should do things, right? Then you go to the other shul, you know, two blocks down, which is slightly more, whatever, right, left, or center, and they say, you know what? We're great. That shul, they're terrific. They're a bit right wing. Our shul, we're right smack in the middle. What we do, you know, it's where we appreciate things, and the people go to college half time, or they go part time, and the women wear this kind of thing, or that kind of thing. We're right smack in the middle. Everybody thinks, you know, that they're, they're walking down, myself included, by the way, I really am right now, that, um, that you go down the street, and you know, God has his center, like his, you know, that thing, like, you know, the Israeli army, they'll look, do, 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 do. That's the perfect Jew. That's it. And if a guy's more right, right, you know, it's like, buddy, could you relax, please, okay? This isn't, you know, to the back to the left of you. You know, let, let me teach you. Let me teach you. Right? <laughs> so that's, that, that's a good view. And so, and we're trying to do, you know, to the end. So that's what we all have. And that's what we want to, we, we, we want to, we want to recognize that, that everybody is. So it says this. Mm -hmm. We think, and what, the good part of the thing in Israel recently, is that everybody, there, there was so, there was so much, there's so little fighting. Everyone really, they, they say identified, or it's, it's such a sudden you and your octus, people were so together, right? I know, I, I, it was, everybody felt bad for people who were kidnapped, whether they were Sioni or right wing, nothing, they, whether they were sick, or it didn't matter, you were like, you were a soldier in the army. Like, I got out, and I, was, and I and give, give, give a soldier, I was thank you for being here. I'm like, I want to give, give I probably every American to talking about. Like, give the guy, I give a tour, I get a hug, I'm like, I'm so glad you're an Israeli soldier. The guy's like, you know, I ain't got a problem here. But, but you, 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 you are so identified with people in the country, or more so, because there was a war. So what is it, we think this is this, what, why is it that God views unity? Really caring about other people is such a deep thing. But we think that like, caring about other people, or being tolerant, is something we do, right? I mean, yeah, I get up in the morning, and I pray, and I exercise, and I take, you know, get my kids off to school, and I'm nice to my wife, and I keep kosher, and I also try to be tolerant and loving and inclusive. Other things I do. It's nothing, so it's not that way. He says that, he says that, that unity is not, it's not part of what it's who we are as a people. That it brings God's power. When we give up that, we stop being that way. God, you know, we have, we have that kind of six children, right? What do I tell my kids the most, you know, when they're fighting? You know, so, oh, they fight, you know, like proper kids, they fight. And I say, 
when you get older, you're going to be best friends with each other. You're going to see that a lot of your friends are going to fade away, and you're going to be best friends with each other. They're like, oh, no, I'm not. Oh, I'm not with her. I'm like, oh, you know? And I'm like, yes, you are. You know? And they know that it's like, and they, they, they either they you know they humor me, but they know it's deeply important to me. Of all the things I tell them, that's the one they know is deeply important to me. They get along with each other, they support each other, they respect each other, they don't, you know, they don't point out bad things. Like, I like, I like when they, you know, my, so my, my son is seven, but Bale is six. So if I ever punish her, I'll say to me, I'll say, Tati, don't yell at her. She's so little, you know? And I mean, she's being a pain. And she's like, you know, destroying the entire house. She won't go to bed. The, 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 those, those, those little things are all over the floor, you know? She's destroying. I'm like, go to your room. No, don't make her. She's so little. She doesn't understand. She understands plenty, you know what I'm saying? But, but I like that he defends her. I really like that he defends her. Sometimes it's just because he defends her, I'll let her out, you know? Because I, I want to inculcate that treat in him that they back each other up. Right? Life can be tough, and all you have is the people who are close to you. So that's what God wants us to be. So I was, um, he's, uh, you have to, like, what does it mean we're not unified? So I was in, uh, about 15 years ago, remember, it seems to have you remember, I went to lunch at the restaurant. You know my most favorite dessert company? My, it's it's, it's going to be my most favorite now. I took a my most favorite dessert company. Kosher restaurant in Midtown. And I went with a friend, who was visit a woman, Mel, my wife knew about him, she knew about him. And um, it's in the videos here, unless you know what happened here, don't worry. And um, it's like therapy, I'm just thinking, And uh, we're, here, we're about to order, and Mel, and Mel says, you know, I know, she says, the waitress, no, I ordered, I ordered a fish, she ordered salad, all women get salad, get salad, get salad, get salad. And she tells the waitress, she says, uh, you know, are there any nuts? And I'm the nuts. No, there's no nuts, okay? She says, you sure there's no nuts? Yeah, we ate this all the time, there's no nuts there. No nuts, great. So we're talking, talking, talking. They bring my fish, and they bring her salmon. I'm sorry, they bring her salad, and she takes her fork, dips it into the, you know, this salad, and brings it to her lips. The rest of the nut, like, working under the tomato or something like that. Right? She brings it to her lips. The nuts, like, touch her lips. No chewing, no swallowing, nothing. Just the latest touch. Her eyes roll back in her head. She grabs, she reaches down to the ground, like, what's going on? She grabs an EpiPen from her purse. She reaches up like this, she plunges into her leg. As her eyes roll in the back of her head, she says, she says, girl, call 911, and she collapses next to me on the floor. And I'm like, I was like, you know, is that okay? And like, you know, what do you do? I totally panicked. Who am I call? I call the rip, rip, for all. I guess she was, she's allergic to nuts. She's allergic to nuts, but that's for sure, right? So we call 911, I call her best friend, I call her parents, what's happening, we go in the hospital, anyway, she ends up okay, right? But one night to her, she collapsed. It wasn't a small allergy, it was a huge allergy, right? Huge allergy. So I know now, now I'm always a joke, I'm like, no, you know, no nuts, right? And she's coming to the house, I'm like, you know, some no nuts for the person, keep the nuts far away. This was her because, because not being unified for us to God is like nuts. It, it, t it takes his, he, 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 he gives us energy when we're together, right? He gives us energy, that's what he wants from us. He wants us to be together. And when we take that, when he takes that away from us, so, so then we can't do anything. So if we go back to, so what time of year, you know, this is, this is the time of year when God wants us to really work on all things important. And we believe that come Rosh Hashanah, the whole next year, we're judged. Everything is predetermined Rosh Hashanah. So I think that this poor kid who died in the forest, that was predetermined Rosh Hashanah. Like that, like it happened to Rosh Hashanah. So we, like, it's a very, very serious day, and this is like the preparation time for it. And this day is a tremendous opportunity for us to have like the most phenomenal year ever, right? And so uh, one thing, to get, and I tell people, the most important thing you can do is get God on your side. Peace on your side, everything else, you know, goes easy, goes easy. So if you want, this is back to the story, it's talking about Tisha B'Av, the destruction of temples. So what happened on Tisha B'Av? God takes the Jews out of, out of Israel, and he takes them to the uh, the desert, and he has like, this auto, this cool, this cool contraption. What's a cool contraption? 
It's it's like the, uh, it's almost like from the uh, with Charlie Chop factor. It's like that cool elevator, right? You go in the elevator, they go in the desert. You can see all sides out. It flattens the land. It destroys the scorpions. It has like seamless web for kosher. You can order like you want sushi, you want steak, you want you know eggs of reese, whatever whatever food you want. It comes automatically delivered. It's 72 degrees. You're traveling through the desert. Everyone has their own like you know. I was uh, on, on the plane, you know, and you have like the business class seats like this, and you got the you know you got the and you got the things in front of you. And you got to have your own TV. It was an awesome way to travel, right? He takes him to the desert, and then he's about to go to Israel, and God says, yeah, I'm not coming in with you. I'm not coming in with you. And the people are petrified. And they complain to God, and they say, you know, what? You, you, you have to let us in. We you mean you're coming with us. You destroy Egypt. You crushed the desert. You gave us this great contraption to travel, and now we go by ourselves? We can't do it by ourselves. And God says, that's it. I'm wiping you out. I'm wiping you out. Such a funny thing when he responds. Now Moshe, Moses, goes to God and he begs for the life of the Jewish people. Now, if you were Moshe, and God says, Moshe, look, I'm going to replace them with you. If you were Moshe and you were begging for the life of the Jewish people, what argument would you use? What would you use? Right? So, my friend Charlie Harari says, he says, here's the argument he would use. And Moshe would use this. He says that, here's what he said. He would say, God, they're scared. Right? So my, I have six kids. I taught them all how to ride a bike. Right? If you can ride a bike, you know, you got to miss the camera. You get, you, know, you get them on the bike, right? They got their helmet on, they got the elbow pads, they got the knee pads, they're like petrified like this. So you take off the training wheels, and they're like, no, you know, no, what are you going to do? And you hold on to the seat under here, and you're like, you know, come on, you know, Sarah, let's go, you know. She's like, no, and I'm like, you know, Sarah, you're doing it. So we're at the first 20 yards, she's doing nothing. I'm holding the bike, she's going like two miles an hour, maybe one mile an hour, and she's pedaling. But I'm holding on to the bike. That's the first thing, right? And the second step is, you know, you tell you, you, you don't tell everybody to go, but you let go. It's like, don't let go. You know, I'm not gonna go. You're not gonna go, right? I'm not gonna let go. Huh? You, you go, you let go. And then the third time, and then finally you, you like keep her going. It's very scary to ride a two-wheeler the first time. It's very scary. If I was my hotel come on. You send the Jews in, they're scared. They were with you the entire time. You want to go to the land of Canaan, they're petrified. Right? They're petrified. And they have a right to be petrified. That would be, in my opinion, a very good, you know, rational excuse, a rational argument. He doesn't say that. He says, God, yeah, look, if you don't, if you kill Jews right now, everyone in Canaan is going to say, they're God. Ha! He's a joke. He's a one trick pony. He got him out of Egypt because, you know, the stars aligned. There were these natural occurrences that happened. There wasn't really God doing it. The sea split because of the east wind. They go into the desert. You know, it was, it was a calm time in the desert. But the Canaanites, he can't mess with us. You know, God, they're going to put, they're gonna put pictures of all the Jews on Twitter or Snapchat, right? It's not all these guys. That, the whole world's going to know that you let them die in the desert, God. You're going to be in big trouble. There's no one's going to talk to you. You're going to be a huge PR problem, God. That's what they're saying to God, right? Now, a PR problem, like he's God. He's got no self-esteem issues. He doesn't need any therapy, right? He created therapists. He created Egypt. He created the desert. What are you talking about? But he says back, slap the kid around. He says, no, I forgive you. I forgive you. He says back to them. It's like, what's going on, right? What is, what's the lesson? What, what's happening here? That the Jews wanted to go in. They said no. For a good reason, they were scared. Moshe, God's going to whip them out. Then he's not whipping them out. And yet he forgives them. Like, well, what piece of the puzzle are we missing? So I was on the flight back from Israel, I took the day flight back, right? And uh, right next to me, I sit in the, sit in the front like economy. I don't, I don't spring for business class yet, but I spring, I spring for economy plus, right? I got a lot of room for myself, keep my legs all the way up, it's great. Right next to me in the front is the kid in the, uh, is, is that bassinet section, where they put the kid, you know, they put the kid on a little thing like that, the kid's sleeping, so the parents go, and they put the kid in front of you, eight month old kid. So the parents are there, it's a cute kid, and he's looking over at me, and I'm like, you know, my way. So I take the kid over, and I put him in my lap, and he's putting all these things, he sees my finger, and he like, you know, starts to see, he thinks there's milk in my finger like this. He starts like, you know, he's sucking on your finger for like two out. The kid's totally happy from zero to two with like nothing. They're totally easy to please at that age, right? Very easy to please. The kid gets a bit older, my kid's age, and they become a terror, right? Three to five years old, three to six, the kids run the entire house. It's just not worth it to fight the battle, right? At that age, the kids get whatever they want, and the parents, especially like the fifth or sixth kid, the parents are, are totally, you know, we've just given up. And I saw recently the saying there was a there was a family. You can tell it's like the third or fourth kid in these kind of situations. It was it was summertime, and it was 
pouring inside, not dripping, pouring, right? And it's like five in the afternoon, and there's a mother who's gone shopping with four kids. Why should we shop with four kids? Because clearly there was no babysitter. You can like, read these things there, bro. She's at, at the shopping center with four kids. It's five in the afternoon. Her husband's at work. She needed food. So she goes shopping in the shopping center, and it's pouring. So she has the kids, she's literally the kids in the car, and the little kid is like two years old, there's no rain, right? By the first kid, you get like the super special raincoat that breathes, and has special biometric material that didn't kill animals for, you know? So the first kid gets all the good stuff. By the fourth kid, it's like, you'll get a little wet, you'll get wet, you'll get wet too, right? So the kid is sitting there, and is getting drenched as the mother's putting like bag one in the car, and bag two in the car, and it's like totally forgotten about the kid, right? Because you can tell at that point, the parents are so beaten down, that, and the kid's having a blast, you know, it doesn't know what's it's so warm. The kid's having fun, it's 80 degrees outside, the rain's coming down, the kid's having a blast, he's drenched, but who cares, right? Kids at that age, when he gets bedtime in my house, by eight o'clock at night, we just don't care anymore. They'll stay up till 8.30, who cares, we just want to play. Those kids at that age, they dominate the house. Whatever they get, they, whatever they want, they get, right? That's what a little kid is. It's all about his own desires. Whatever they want, they don't think about another person, another teammate, they don't think about their siblings, they think about cookies, nosh, and a late bedtime. Right? That's all they want, and that's what they get. It's not, believe me, it's not worth it. I say, they'll still get married, it's not worth the headache. The first kid would get like this. Our first kid, 702 bedtime, you know what I'm saying? You know, it was like, in the morning, the hair was, the hair was pressed and perfect. But last kid, doesn't matter. So that's when you're a little kid, right? Because <clears throat> everything is what you want. It's when you get older, you recognize that it's not all about you. Right? It's not all about you. So, <clears throat> anyone here a hockey fan play hockey? I played hockey when I was a kid. And I thought I was good until, you know, about 14, 15 years old. But I, li I live in Philadelphia. And um, I played against Mike Richter, who was the goalie for the Rangers. You know Mike Richter was a long time ago? He was the goalie for the Rangers. So, I mean, this is, you can see how pathetic an athlete I was. When I was in 10th grade, we beat him 6-1 in 10th grade. And I, and I took a shot at the top of the key, and he saved it. The second period, I remember like it was yesterday, for a Jewish guy that's like, you know, he told me after the game, he says, hey, that was a nice shot. When you were told a nice shot by like an Olympic TV goalie, you remember forever, you know what I'm saying? So like that was, it was been 30 years ago, and I still tell you what Mike Richter told me, you know, nice shot, you know what I'm saying? That's as close as I got to pro sports, as close as I got. But uh, in 1980, I was 13 years old, my bar missed for a year, and the, uh, the America was playing Russia in the Olympics. Right? So the Russians were the best team in the world. Right? There was no such thing as amateurs in Russia. And Russia won the past 12 years. They had not lost the game in the Olympics. They had not lost the game for 12 years. Right? They were the best team in the world. And they were playing against the Americans who were kids in college, couldn't go pro. So Russia essentially raised 10 or 20 Cossacks from the biggest parts of Russia, gave them raw meat to eat when they were like six years old, took them to the best Russian doctors, put them on steroids, taught them how to skate, and if those guys, the ones who made it through, you know, the gulag, they came and played, played hockey against the rest of the world, and they crushed everybody. It wasn't an accident. Like, they were the 10 best hockey players in the entire continent, playing against the Americans who wouldn't go pro, right? See, so, I'm 13 years old. And this was like, and I remember when the U.S. beat Russia, you said, you, we were like dancing, we know school was canceled the next day, everyone, we played hockey, we couldn't, we could, like, like, I remember, I was, like, we did, I was 13 years old, they were my heroes, right, there's so many, they were my heroes back then. They made a movie called Miracle on Us. When I, when I, when I, when I, when I, get, when I want to get inspired, I still watch that clip on YouTube of the, the last 40 seconds of that game. So Miracle on Us starts, Herb Brooks is the coach, and he's got to get a group of these silly American college teams together to play the Olympics. <clears throat> What does he do? There's one scene where they messed up in a practice game, and he was really upset at them. He said, okay, guys, you're not going to practice, you're not going to, to shower now. Back on the ice. He gets him back on the ice, and this is like the turning point of the movie, right? And he says, okay, guys, suicide drills. Now, suicide drills, you go from your end of the ice to the half to quarter down, back halfway, back three quarters, and back all the way down and back again. That's called a suicide drill. There's suicides in basketball and suicides in hockey, right? And they're, they want to commit suicide again. It's what called suicide, right? So he has them going one time. He's like, again, have all coach until you guys get it. He goes again, and like you know they're coughing and they're gonna get sick and they're gonna injure. He goes again, and he calls that. Where are you from? And the guy goes, you know, what's your name? Scott Christensen. Who do you play for? Boston University. You know, again. Where are you from? Your name? Jim Craig. Who do you play for? University of Minnesota, again, she calls out again. They're going on for an hour, two hours. And he, what is he trying to get? What's he trying to get? And then he calls out, you know, <clears throat> what's your name? The captain's name was Ruzioni. Who do you play for? And then the music stops, you know. And he was like, 
crescendo. He says, the United States of America. <laughs> dun, 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 you know, and that was like, he had, he had coalesced the whole, these guys who played for all the teams into recognizing that their goal was to play for one team, not to be their, their own people anymore, for one team. And that, you know, and that's an important part of it. You recognize, you know, like when you have a family, so we, you know, we, we say we, we have family now. When I was 25 years old, it was wonderful, right? I could put all my possessions in the back of my car, and I could drive where I, I was totally free. Totally free, right? And I could drive, I went to go games in Florida, went to work in summer camps. I could, I could whatever I wanted, at the drop of a hat, I had no possessions and no responsibilities. It was all about me, you know? I was like, oh, it was great, it was great. And then now, you know, six, six kids, and we make many decisions that aren't the best for my life. I make decisions that are good for the kids, or good for her, good for the older kid. You know, your, your life gets much more serious and much more heavy as you get older because you're taking on much more responsibility, right? And that's, that's the beauty of life. That's the beauty of caring about other people, right? That is the, and, 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 you, and you do, and you're, you're respected more. You respect yourself more for that. You're respected more for that life. It's a much heavier place to be. And although part of me, because I had my, uh, my wife's sister was over, and she was uh, she had a, had a break up with somebody, she was 26 years old, and I'm like, you know, so what's going on? She says, you know, I'm not, I'm not. she says, and my wife's at the table with us, she says, you know, I really don't want to be in a relationship right now. And I was like, oh, you know, me either. Me either. You know, and, you know and I was like, okay, funny, right? But there's a, there's a part of it was like, well, I'm like, just kidding, wasn't just kidding. And, um, there's uh, the part of everybody that wants that freedom, but, but the real pleasure and the real responsibility comes from making decisions and being part of people that, that aren't, you know, that, 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 that's bigger than you, right? And that's, and that's just not your family, that's your friends, that's your community, that's taking care of somebody else, right? And that's what God wants from us. That's what God wants from us. So the, um, the why did Moshe say this? To go back to the story, why, why did Moshe say this to God? Why do you use that defense as, your name's gonna be bad. That God created us in this world to, to, to be bigger than ourselves and to be on His team. And He's got a mission, right? His mission is to make us a light unto the nations, to teach them what it means to, to act a certain way, be a certain way, and to really care about other people, right? To really care deeply about other people. And that's what He was upset at them for. He said, you give, don't, you, don't, you don't not go into Israel. You don't say, no, thank you for the gift. You say, how we give the gift? You say, how, how high, God, how high? Because that's how God wants to manifest himself in the world. And it's, it's so important for all of us to be out there and to do things that, that sanctify our name and sanctify God's name and to, to care for other people and you know, to, to keep your mouth shut, to call your mother even though she knows she could be a pain, to call your mother-in-law even though she could be a pain, to, to call your best friend, to call your sister, to, to, to have all those things work, work for you. That's the most important thing. And that's how you, and, and, and when you, you know, to love other people means, you know, if you know that God is going to reward you in a big way, that's very cheap way of looking at it, for doing something like that, you do it 20 times over, right? 20 times over, right? And He does. He really does. He pays you back that way. And so that's what God, God wants us to know this time of year, that we're on His team, and that everybody's equal. You can't look down on somebody else. You have to look up at them, right? Look up at them and be equal to them. It says, it says that the, um, at the end of Tisha B'Av, we sing a song, we sing a song, or Yirmiyahu sings a, and it says that the kindness of Hashem never ends, right? It's endless. There's no end, end, there's no endless to His mercy. And He says, why? So the, the, there's a cute way to, 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 to translate that passage. So the, the first Chabad, the Balatani, says the following, says, Chaz Hashem, the kindness of God, key is because lo tam nu, that we are not perfect, right? We're not perfect people. But if, but if we if we believe in God, if God helps us, so that kindness keeps us going, keeps us going. Let's just do more than we can. We can be more tolerant. We can keep our mouth shut. We can go to an event to, to support someone else. You no, know, we don't want to go. You know, this year that I was, uh, I don't remember. I missed one of my friend's weddings. Right, he made a wedding for his second son. He's got five or six kids. And by us, you know, when it's like wedding season, you can be busy every single night of the week. Right, every single night of the week, you can be busy. So it's very hard to go. And also the problem I learned to say, right, to say. Every wedding is a good hour away. It's just far enough that you can't not go, but it's really a pain to get there, right? If it was like, you know, two minutes away, you go and you come back. But if you go to Brooklyn, you gotta go nine o'clock at night, you gotta go over the bridge, you gotta find a parking place, you don't forget it, right? You gotta go to Lakewood, it's an hour, 10 minutes, and you gotta stay for an hour, it's three hours, it's always difficult. Well, my friend's weddings, you know, I, 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 you know I, I didn't go, and I felt bad, I felt bad at calling me after I said, you know, I'm sorry to go. Okay, but, but I didn't go, you know what I'm saying? And I should've gone, I should've gone. 
right? Those are the things you always, you, you always want to do as many of those things as you can. And, and, and that's the, you know, we're, we're only limited in our world without God. Once God's, we have much more power to do things than we think if we bring God into the picture. Well, that's the first part. <clears throat> the second part is this, that um, how do we love ourselves, right? How do we love ourselves? I think the first thing is, two things. One, you have to be able to forgive yourself for things you did wrong before. You must forgive yourself for things. Some people feel that you don't have to forgive yourself for things you did wrong. That's one thing. Then you can forgive others. And two, you have to know the, the tremendous potential a person has. So, mm -hmm. it says that we, uh, when we go to war in the desert, what did the Jews take with them to war? They took this as the, the ark, the ark, Indiana Jones, the Raiders of the Lost Ark, also a great movie. So, they had the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant was the, the first set of tablets. Moshe went to Harsinai, brought down the tablets, right? Threw them down in anger when he saw the Jews were dancing with, an, with, a, with, an, with another god, with the with golden calf. And they kept those shards, and they brought them out to war in front of us. Now let's, let's take the, imagine that. You go to war, and what do you bring there? You want God's mercy to be there for you, to help you with the battles. And you bring the one thing with you that angers God the most. You bring that to battle. Right? Of all things you bring to battle, don't bring that. You know, so you want your parents to help you. Bring your report card where you got an A. Not the time where you were you know, called into jail because you were reporting to it. And I know, don't tell, you, don't tell your father that. You say, Dad, I got an A. You know, give me, don't tell Why do we bring to God the thing that reminds us of the worst part of us? The worst part. Two stories. I was uh, at a friend in, in college, John. So John went through some difficult times in college. Parents got divorced when he was in college. And he had a sister. Her name was Susan. I remember it was Miami. They um, and they had her sorority. They had a, a father-daughter like uh, dance or something. They bring your father to campus. You know, it's like a nice thing to do to bond and help. So everyone brought their fathers. They were from a prominent family in, in Miami. And she invited to the to the um, to the sorority dinner her her mother's like to be stepfather, not her own father, right? They weren't talking. She was gonna you know really stick it to him. And you know, okay, so what happened now? Many years later, they're very, very happy together again. But the time was very nasty, not a nice thing to do. Not a nice thing to do. They don't talk about that time. They don't talk about that, that event anymore. Those two years when that divorce happened, they, don't, they, they put up, it's not to be spoken about, right? If something that happened that was bad, they don't talk about it, right? You can imagine a father, it's a very difficult thing. You know, it's, it's, it's a very deep wound. It's a very deep wound. And I saw in New York City, the, the, the times like two years ago, there was two couples that they had, uh, they got, they were dating and like, they broke up and the, the husband and wife want to marry each other with their spouses, right? And they were thinking like, they have kids and other kids and they're so selfish and how does the husband feel his wife left him? It's a deep, deep wound, right? A man's whole thing about honor and respect. I don't think like, it's a, okay, you got to publicize it. You got to put it in the New York Times. The whole world's got to know you left this guy for someone else. Like, it's just it's so not nice. How can things happen? Hide it. Don't tell everybody. Hide it. <coughs> but... But for God, he's telling us, you know, I don't, I don't care how bad you were to me, right? I'm forgiving you. And I don't care about your, even at your worst <coughs> possible moment. Excuse me. Even at your worst possible moment, God's telling us, I'm still with you. And no matter what, I'm always forgiving of you. Even one time, or two times, or a thousand times, right? Say, that's why he tells me, you put your own personal battle out there. The worst time of your life, God's saying, bring that with you. Tell me what that was. Don't hide it. I know what happened then. I know it was only temporary rebellion. I know you didn't mean it to be wrong. Don't worry about it. I know you were your worst, and I'm still forgiving. And I still love you. Right? So, like, my, my friend who I didn't go to his uh, wedding, he doesn't, he's not upset. You know, but, like, but he feels okay. Kirk didn't do the right thing. And I feel bad. I didn't do the right thing. And so I, I have a custom every Rosh Hashanah. This year, you know, occasionally uh, you do something, and it was like a stupid thing, right? You got to call the people and apologize. You gotta call before Russia and say, I was sorry. It's it's hard, right? Something you make a bad judgment call, you do something wrong. You gotta call people before Russia and tell them you're sorry. You made a mistake, right? You gotta do that. That's a very hard thing to do, and it helps. No one's perfect. But you still gotta put you gotta hurt a person a certain way. And with real people, those things never go away. 
people always kind of judge, you know, you know what, be a little bit careful. They're not that way. Right, I had a friend recently would go to shit up with a date with a girl. He called about her, he found out some stuff, and because something bad on her past, he's not going out. Like, oh, is he right or is he wrong? I thought he was wrong. I thought I think they're a good match. But, but he, he, I didn't say, I didn't ask what things were, it was not my business. He found out stuff, he felt, you know, her past is too much to know. That's how people act in the world, right? That's how people act in the world. God doesn't act that way. God doesn't care about your past. He, he, he knows your worst time. He's telling us, bring it out to battle in front of you. Every challenge you have, bring it out. I want to see it, and I'm still going to merciful to you. Right? And that's how you, 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 like you love yourself more. Because you know that God's behind you, and He cares about you no matter what, no matter what you're doing. Right? And that's a very important thing this time of year. And the second thing is this, by the, uh, by, by the golden calf, what happened? That, that, um, you know, Moses goes up for 40 days to the mountain, and he comes back down. He comes back down 12 hours late. In those 12 hours, the Jews build a golden calf, and some of them say, this is the guy that took us out of Egypt. You know, it's crazy, because you, you popped it out of your, uh, of your earrings four minutes ago. What are you talking about? So they said, no, what the problem they had was, they couldn't believe, they needed a God. They didn't motion went up, they don't want a second man, they don't want a, an Aaron, his brother, a whore. They, they wanted a God to leave them. They didn't believe in the potential a person has, right? They didn't believe in that, how great a person can become. And how great Moshe was. They wanted a substitute. They wanted another God, right? And you have to believe in how great a person can become. I just finished a uh, book on the plane, the tens of books on the plane, right? 1776, about how George Washington saved his country in, uh, in, in the uh, in War of Independence. And I never realized before how close he came to losing the war. We were this close to still being uh, you know, servants of the British. Right? The war was essentially over. We wanted to beat uh, Bunker Hill. Then the British come back with like a hundred boats you know, outside of New York City. And they come, the Redcoats are coming, and they massacred us. And Washington ran away from Brooklyn. As usual, yeah, there was a fight over the Brooklyn. They, you know, there was a Throgs Neck Bridge. Was, was, it was an area called Throgs Neck. They were up and down the Hudson. Very interesting stories that way. And there was a, that they, they wiped out most of the army, and the rest escaped. It was like a miracle. There was a, a fog over Brooklyn, and Washington army escaped. And they went back to Philadelphia, and there were 3,000 people left. They were being chased by the British. Right? And at the same time, British were sending around proclamations in the country to sign to support Britain. Everyone's like, well, who's going to win this? The American rulers? They all signed. We don't want to get in jail, so they signed for Britain. And Washington was done. Done. The war was essentially over. And then he came back and he beat these, uh, they, like they hired Germans to fight. He beat them. Okay, we won. We know we won the war. We're, we're American now. But it was so close. And I said it was one person that changed it. It was one person that rallied the truth and changed it. That was it. It was, it was, you know, it was, uh, it was George Washington did it. We have to believe deeply in the potential a person has to change things for their own life and for the community and for the Jewish people. It's, uh, it, it, it really happens that way. I'll finish off with a, uh, a beautiful story about a guy named Aaron Margolis. So it's Aaron Margolis' true story. Uh, lives in Israel right now. He had a very, very difficult upbringing. He's a world famous speaker. He, he had polio when he was a little kid in Be'er Sheva. He got polio. Before he got polio, he was a two-year-old kid. He lived in a kibbutz in, uh, in Be'er Sheva. And some kid started the tractor. And the tractor you know, was going right towards him. And he was about to run over the tractor. And it ran over him. And he lost his vocal cords. He couldn't speak. He couldn't speak. He was so scared that he couldn't speak. And then he got polio. He was in a hospital in Jerusalem for four or five years with polio. They were one polio ward in the country. And to get from Be'er Sheva, to Jerusalem in the 60s, it was like a three hour ride. So his mother came once a week. But the rest of the country off on Shabbos. He was an Orthodox kid. So on Shabbos, everyone came and said, Oh, the poor kid, his parents don't come to visit him. He says he would pull the blanket over his head and for 24 hours just thinking about things, pretending he was asleep. So no one knew you know, what he was doing. And they wouldn't feel bad for him. And he had like went deep into his mind. And he just pretended for it. He felt so lonely. He couldn't come with his leg. He was one of the only the three people to get out of that polio war in the 60s. Fine. He goes to yeshiva when he was 14 years old. He was a skinny little kid. And he had a terrible stuttering problem from those times when he couldn't speak in a poem. He couldn't speak well. So he sat in the back of the room and he could not talk well at all. At all. Imagine a group of little kids your age, 14 years old. You're embarrassed. He was a smart kid, but he couldn't, he couldn't get the words out. So he was in 10th grade 
the rabbi made him, the Rosh Hashim made him go and get speaking lessons. <clears throat> it was terribly painful. He was mortified to speak, mortified to, he had no friends, right, because he, he, was, he was teased. <clears throat> so he goes to the doctor in B'nai Brak from Jerusalem. And, uh, and the doctor was a very tough doctor, he speaks therapist. And, and he made him the rules that if he didn't come back, he couldn't, if he didn't do the homework, he couldn't come back the next week. So he went to, to B'nai Brak and uh, Tel Aviv, and the first week the doctor made him talk to a doll. Okay, so that really, you know, when the private doctor's always you can talk to a doll. Hi, ha, 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 how, how are you? He got that, fine. A couple weeks later, he had to ask directions how to get back and forth to the bus. Stop the stranger on the street, and have him say, yeah, yeah, he goes, really, no, 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 you get it out, and he like stuttered to get it out. He could practice that. Okay, that's, you know, that's one step, and he tried that. That was like four or five weeks, right, he kept doing that, and then, he had his, you know, directions back, he had conversations, and finally he had, you know, his final test, right? This is a person who felt terrible about himself. He had no self-confidence, right? And he, 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 he didn't know what to do again. Who, who was he going to be in the world? Nobody, he did nothing. And uh, his test was, he had to ask a question in class, in front of all of his classmates, right? And if he doesn't that, he can't come back the next week. So this guy, Margot, he's 15 years old. And he studies the text the rabbi is talking about. And he never asked the question in class once, in like, it was, I think, 11 and 3 years, never once did he talk to class. He didn't talk at all, but not, you know, class never spoke. <laughs> he, had, he had the doctor's going on Thursdays. So Friday there's no class, Sunday's class doesn't speak, Monday doesn't speak, Tuesday doesn't speak, Wednesday does not speak, Thursday it's do or die. He's got to go to the appointment, you know, later that afternoon. So the class is now long. At the end of the class, like he's parts in his mouth. He raises his hand and he's, you know, they're gonna tease me. You know what I'm saying? He's never gonna complain. He's a frog in the back of the room. And the teacher says to him, no, nope. yeah, what's the question? So we ask the question, a very hard question. And the teacher says, wow. Well. He says, yeah, the concise, who's a commentator of uh, the Torah, says, ask the same question. It's a very, very good question, but I can't get into it now in the class. It's too complicated. We'll talk about it after the class. That was it. He's put his hand down, and he says, like, he asked the question in class. Nobody laughed, nobody snickered. The teacher even respected the question. He says his confidence soared. It soared, right? It soared. It became like a, it became, he couldn't believe he asked the question like that. That was his potential. He was achieving his potential. I want to tell you, he became a person who got two kinds of cancer, and, and, and he was saved from both kinds of cancer. He became an extremely successful and short salesman. He was a very wealthy man today. He wrote a book about his trials, that is, and it's been published in English in Israel. He's lectured, I don't know, probably lectures 100 days a year right now. He's come to America to lecture. He lectures all over Israel. He's a world famous personality. And, and, you know, for a person who, who, who still has suffered from polio and still can't speak well, right? He, he, he became with such potential in himself. But the end of the story about stuttering is he, he asked the teacher years later, like, you know, I was thinking, I was in class that day, and I was like, you know, if, if a giant frog had come into the classroom and said grip, people would have been, like, well, that's what people would have been, like, people would have been shocked, and no one said a word. No one snickered, no one turned around, he looked, and I was raising my hand, like, no one, what happened? He said, I'll tell you, he said, the entire class was in on the, on the game. He said, the Rosh Shiva told us you were taking these lessons. Everybody knew you were taking lessons. And he told us under pain of expulsion that you had to ask a question this week. And when you did, all the kids were told not to snicker, not to turn, not to do anything, to keep their eyes glued to their menorah, <clears throat> and the red was to treat it like any other question and move on. The entire class was there helping you. Hey, no idea. That was 10 years later. This <clears throat> is that the potential of a person. That's what it means to help someone else. That's what it means to, to be able to grow in of yourself, right? To not feel bad about who you were. To have the self-confidence to grow, right? So, and, that, and that's what El is all about, right? It's about helping each other. It's about saying with God's on your side, you can do anything. You can forgive yourself. You can be great. You can take the worst possible thing. You know, this man speaks all around the world. He's inspiration to thousands. And he had, I'm going to tell you, of all the upbringings I've seen, it's got one of the top ten worst upbringings, right? It, it just, he it just had, he was in a hospital, he couldn't speak. He, he, his family, no money, was nothing. 
and he grew to be wealthy. He said all those things he had. So that's the uh, that's the class for today. I want to thank you all for coming. I want to uh, thank you. I want to wish you a see a a good writing, good inscription. Everyone should try this L to do something beyond themselves, right? You should do something you don't want to do. Nothing. Do do the hard stuff. Do one hard thing this L for you know I see this. Do one thing for God you wouldn't do. Whatever it is, you know, you're gonna to go to a minion more, you're gonna to run to someone once a day, you're gonna light candles. Pick one thing for God and one thing for other people that you haven't done before and do two things. It'll it'll bode you well, it'll be good for everybody. Okay, so fine enough, enough of my preaching. <laughs>